The next type of intermolecular force is dipole forces. This time we're going to consider a polar molecule like hydrogen chloride. We know from electronegativity differences between hydrogen and chlorine that this molecule has a bond dipole. The hydrogen is partially positive and the chlorine is partially negative. So it's easy to imagine if there was another hydrogen chloride molecule in the vicinity, the positive hydrogen of one molecule would be attracted to the negative chlorine on another molecule. And in fact, there's a whole three-dimensional structure of attractions between partial positive and partial negative charges. So these are known as dipole forces, which exist between polar substances. So I'd like to compare hydrogen chloride versus fluorine. I'd like to point out that the molecular weight of these two materials is very similar. Hydrogen chloride is 36.5 and fluorine is 38. So a difference in mass is not a great effect on any differences in boiling point. Let's evaluate the intermolecular forces available to each molecule. Hydrogen chloride is a molecule, so it has dispersion forces, but also a polar molecule, so it has permanent dipolar forces. Fluorine is a nonpolar molecule, so the only intermolecular forces available to it are dispersion forces. Now let's look at their boiling points. You notice they are different by more than 100 degrees. That difference is due to the permanent dipolar forces. The process of boiling something means that one breaks the intermolecular forces. So the fact that hydrogen chloride has a much higher boiling point indicates that it has much stronger intermolecular forces than fluorine does. There are two requirements for a molecule to be a polar substance. First, electronegativity differences are needed between bonded atoms, but the shape of the molecule is also important. So here is how to determine if a molecule has a permanent dipole, which means to determine if a molecule is polar. First, we need to know what the molecule looks like. So let's work with sulfur dioxide. We can work with just one resonance structure since we're just looking at the atoms in the shape, not necessarily the bond order. And so here is a possible Lewis structure for sulfur dioxide. You notice bent geometry at near a 120 degree bond angle. Our next step after we've drawn the Lewis structure with the proper shape is to show the bond dipole for the electron bonding regions. Which atom is more electronegative, sulfur or oxygen? I hope you answer oxygen. So let's draw in the bond dipoles. Remembering that the less electronegative atom has the positive end of the bond dipole arrow. Along this sulfur oxygen bond, we have one bond dipole pointing at the oxygen. Along the other sulfur oxygen bond, we have one bond dipole pointing at the oxygen. Now imagine that the more electronegative atoms pull, will the central atom move? Well, I hope what you're thinking when you look at this is the pull to the left and to the right seem to balance each other out. But both of these vectors are pulling upward. And that is exactly the molecular dipole. If the atoms move in the scenario, then the molecule has a permanent dipole. So you can imagine if you pull on these oxygens, the sulfur is going to move up. The direction that sulfur moves is the overall dipole of the molecule. When I teach this in person, I also have another way to envision this looking at partial charges. If we think about the partial charges on each atom, Based on electronegativity differences, the oxygens will be partially negative and the sulfur will be partially positive. The center of positive charge will be on the sulfur. The center of negative charge will be in between the two partial negatives. Our negative charge will be here. So if I draw an arrow from the center of positive charge 
pointing at the center of negative charge, you notice I get exactly the same dipole for the molecule as we did by the pulling scenario. Sulfur dioxide is a polar molecule. Let's try the same process, but this time with carbon dioxide. First, we'll draw the Lewis structure and determine the appropriate bond angles. And carbon dioxide is, of course, linear with a 120 degree bond angle. Now let's look at the individual vectors for the bond dipoles. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so our carbon-oxygen bond dipole on the left side will point to oxygen, and on the right side will also point to oxygen. Now imagine that the more electronegative atoms pull. Will the central atom move? Well, I hope that when you look at this, you say, well, they seem to be pulling equally, but in opposite directions. So it kind of looks like if they pull equally, the carbon is not going to move. And that's exactly the conclusion I would come to as well, that this molecule does not have an overall permanent dipole and is therefore a nonpolar molecule. Therefore, it has only dispersion forces and no dipole forces. If I do this with partial charges, each of the oxygens is partially negative and the carbon is partially positive. My center of positive charge is on the carbon. What is my center of negative charge? Well, it's also on the carbon. So if the center of positive charge and negative charge are in the same location, then we have a nonpolar molecule. So this slide is a reminder that polar bonds aren't enough to make a polar molecule. The shape of the molecule must also contribute to the overall polarity. That's why sulfur dioxide is a polar molecule and carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule. Let's try a larger molecule. How about sulfur trioxide? We can work with just one of the resonance structures because all we're interested in is having the right Lewis structure and the right bond angles. So now I have the proper Lewis structure with a shape that is trigonal planar with a 120 degree bond angle. And here are the bond vectors. The center is at sulfur and each of the vectors points toward oxygen. It may be difficult for you to visualize pulling equally along these bonds. So I'll just look at the bottom two. With the bottom two, the pull to the left and the pull to the right cancel out. But let me look at the downward pull. So now I have the downward pull of one of these arrows and the downward pull of the other arrow, assuming the left and right poles cancel out. Perhaps you notice that now I have a situation like carbon dioxide, where the two vectors are pointing exactly the opposite direction and exactly the opposite length. This is a nonpolar molecule. But perhaps you'd rather think about it in terms of the charges. So let me put a partial negative on each of the oxygens and a partial positive on the sulfur. Our center of positive charge is on the sulfur. Our center of negative charge is also on the sulfur. So if the positive charge and the negative charge are located at the same place, we have ourselves a nonpolar molecule. Either way you look at it, pulling on the arrows does not make the center move. And the location of positive charge and the center of negative charge on the molecule are in the same location, therefore a nonpolar molecule. How about phosphorus trifluoride? This is a trigonal pyramidal molecule with a 109 degree bond angle. So we should attempt in our Lewis structure to give this some three dimensional character. Each of the fluorines has a partially negative charge. Each of the fluorines has a partially negative charge. And the phosphorus has a partially positive charge. My center of positive charge is on the phosphorus. 
the fluorines are in a plane in a triangle underneath the phosphorus. So my center of negative charge will be in the middle of the fluorine triangle. Notice that the positive and the negative are located at different places. So I would say that this is a polar molecule and has an overall dipole. We can also look at this with the viewpoint of individual bond dipole vectors. Each of these vectors is pulling downward. Just like the sulfur trioxide molecule, they are going to cancel one another out in the triangular space, but each of the vectors still has a downward component. This makes phosphorus trifluoride a polar molecule with a net dipole, just as I drew when looking at the charges. So once again, shape makes a difference. Sulfur trioxide, which is flat, is a nonpolar molecule. Phosphorus trifluoride, which has three-dimensional character, is a polar molecule. How about this compound, known as methylene chloride? Well, if one looked at it as this flat shape, students might say to themselves, well, the hydrogens are partially positive, the chlorines are partially negative, I can see that the center of positive charge and negative charge is on the carbon, or I can look at the carbon-hydrogen vectors, which cancel out, and the carbon-chlorine vectors, which also seem to cancel out, and call this a nonpolar molecule. But is methylene chloride flat with 90 degree bond angles? It is not. So we need to make sure we take into account that this is a tetrahedral molecule with 109 degree bond angles. So here is what it looks like in all its beautiful three-dimensional representation. I can look at the bond vectors, and this time I have a slight difference in length on the vectors. You notice that the carbon-hydrogen bond dipoles are short. That's because there isn't much electronegativity difference between carbon and hydrogen whereas the carbon-chlorine bond dipoles have a longer length, representing greater electronegativity differences. I hope what you see is that if I look at the two carbon-hydrogens, these seem to point up. And if I look at the carbon-chlorines, these also seem to have an upward cant to them. I can also look at centers of charges. My center of positive charge will be here, between the hydrogens. My center of negative charge will be here, between the chlorines. So once again, I have a scenario where either the vectors all add up to give a vector in a particular direction, or the center of positive charge is in a different location than the center of negative charge. Either one of these points to a polar molecule. This can be a little easier to see in the ball and stick models. Chlorine is a much bigger atom than hydrogen, so hopefully this looks unbalanced to you, and therefore a polar molecule. Whereas if we had carbon tetrachloride, all the atoms around the central atom are of the same type. So carbon tetrachloride is a nonpolar molecule. One easy way to think about this that works for most molecules is that a polar molecule will have different groups around the central atom. We have chlorines and hydrogens. They are different, so methylene chloride is polar. Nonpolar molecules will have the same groups around the central atom, all chlorines. Therefore, this molecule is nonpolar. Let's go back and look at some of the other examples. Phosphorus trifluoride has different groups. It has fluorines and a lone pair, so it is polar. Sulfur trioxide has the same group, all oxygens, so nonpolar. Sulfur dioxide has different groups around the sulfur, oxygen and lone pair. Therefore, it's a polar molecule. Carbon dioxide has the same groups about the carbon, both oxygen, so a nonpolar molecule. 
Having said that, I'm going to mix in a few examples that require thinking about bond dipoles or the center of positive and negative charge. So I'd like to know, is this molecule the nitrate ion polar or nonpolar? And is this molecule, which we are going to imagine as fixed in this particular configuration, is this polar or nonpolar? And to give you a little bit of help, I've put the partial positive and partial negative charges on the atoms. The next question asks, is this arrangement of atoms polar or nonpolar? And is this arrangement of atoms polar or nonpolar? I think you're going to need a little help. It's easier to evaluate this molecule in two different pieces. You may remember this geometry is called trigonal bipyramidal. So first, I want to evaluate the section that is at 180 degrees apart. So the chlorine-phosphorus-chlorine bond is 180 degrees with a chlorine on each side. Is this piece polar or nonpolar? Now let's look at the triangular piece. I'm just going to rotate it so that we can think of this as a flat triangle at 120 degrees. Notice that we have different groups around the phosphorus, a chlorine, a fluorine, and a fluorine. So the groups around the phosphorus are not the same. Is this particular piece polar or nonpolar? And I want to remind you that electronegativity differences between phosphorus and fluorine are greater than the electronegativity difference between phosphorus and chlorine. So these vectors will not have equivalent length. So if either one of these pieces, the 180 degree piece or the triangular piece is polar, you have a polar molecule. It only takes one of them to be polar. I hope that's helped. Please repeat the thought process for the other confirmation. Our last example is a benzene ring with different groups attached to the carbon. The way I'm going to describe to think about this works especially well for benzene rings. Here is my terrible art of a person spinning a plate on a stick. It's much easier to spin the plate when it's balanced compared to when it has unbalanced items on it. So let's look at our first molecule here on the left. Hydrogen is a tiny atom, so that's kind of like having a P on the plate. And the P is glued to the plate so it can't move. Bromine is a larger atom, so that's like having an orange glued to the plate. Is the load on this plate balanced and will it spin without wobbling? If the answer is no, it's polar. If the answer is yes, it's nonpolar. And here's our other plate with oranges and peas glued to the plate. When this spins, will it spin with a balanced load or will it wobble? If it spins balanced, then it is nonpolar. If it's going to wobble, then it's polar. 